Hello and welcome to episode two of Les Odorants with me, Dan, otherwise known as the Fragrance Weirdo, and uh, my good friends James. Yo, yo. And Ben. Hello. Nice to see you guys. How's it been? How's your week been, James? Yeah, pretty good. Same old, you know, routine. Uh, Do you want to know what I've worn? No. Nah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Let's get okay. straight into it with what have you worn? Really quick, right? I'm going to be really concise for me. So okay. on Monday, I wore the Musk by Essential Parfums. Then on Tuesday, I wore uh, Beck's Londoner N6. Oh. Then on Wednesday, I wore Agua de Low L. Thursday was Maitre Parfumer et Gantier, uh, Soy Rouge or something like that. <laughs> Easy for you to say. I know, yeah. Um, and it means uh, red evening or something. It, I don't. Yeah, possibly. It means like I uh, know. So the brand name means oh. like perfumers and gloves. Naturally, yeah. apparently. Well, Gantier uh, is that a glove maker? Yeah, that's that's gloves. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Anywho, uh, Thierry Mugler, B Man, mm-hmm. um, little known flanker. Uh, and Saturday I wore Calvin Klein Obsession for Men and today I'm wearing uh, Detail Miles which I know you you know about that oh yeah you? yeah that's really nice I've, I've yeah. got that it's, it's it's not very strong but it, it's actually not rather pretty and quite enjoyable um, quite mm-hmm. fruity as nice I remember fruity little number yeah yeah, yeah excellent and Ben are you going to give us a day by day blow or are you going to uh... My my week is nowhere near as eclectic as that. I bought uh, Le Leon de Chanel. Uh. Finally, gave into the hype, um, and I've been wearing it every day uh, since since I got it. And um, was it worth the hype? Well, this is. In- <laughs> He's thinking. I'm going to say yeah. I'm going to say yeah. Um, but it's and I think it gets better every day. But I'm still not. 100% on it? There must be an upper limit to getting better every day. I mean, at some point you get so good you think, that you yeah. know, you're brighter than the sun. Well, so so I started at, it started at quite a low level. Okay. Because my, the first time I wore it, it was utter disappointment and I just felt like... Really? Yeah, I just felt like, okay, this is essentially Shalimar. And then, and then I kind of, you know, I started picking out some of the nuances and that actually made it different. Um, and, and I feel like every day I'm wearing it, I'm, I'm finding more of that. And actually, like four or five days on, I'd say it doesn't really smell that much like Shalimar at all now. Like, like you know, after you've picked it apart and really got yeah. into it, mm, yeah. Um, yeah. It's, there, there is a lot of differences. Um, but I still think it's in that ballpark, you know. But, um, but once you pick it apart, there are it, a lot of deviation. But I like it. I think, I think the thing is, if if Chanel did Shalimar, which effectively is what this is, then it wouldn't be Shalimar, and that's kind of what Lillian is. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, I, I, and I think you said it was a very sort of smoothed, almost like simplified kind of uh, version of Shalimar, which I can I can I can get that. Uh, I think the thing that uh, thing that I like about it and that makes it almost unwearable for me. <laughs> Uh, which is a strange sort of paradox, is that um, it's got this kind of animalic uh, labdanum sort of note, which I get. It's slightly like rubbery. It's weird. It's just a really yeah. weird thing. And I notice it in loads of perfumes that people go, oh, wow, that's amazing, and I love that. Uh, and I sort of agree, but I kind of think I get on my nerves and I don't, you know, I wouldn't necessarily want to wear it. So it's another one of those that I think is is potentially a, you know, it's certainly a strong release, and I think Chanel effectively don't—they don't tend to let you down with a lot of stuff. I know this new yeah. one they've done, which is a kind of weird, like Rouge or something number one, uh, which everyone's kind of saying, like, what is this? Is it a cosmetic? Is it a skincare product? Is it a perfume? What is it? Do you know the one I mean? No, no. I, it's called like number one rouge or something like that, and it's meant to be a very minimal. It's for people who don't want to wear perfume, basically. Okay, well um, that rules me out, I'm afraid. Well, exactly. What's the point, you know? Um, but obviously, they they see that there's a market for it, mm. and it's a kind of non-perfume perfume. I haven't tried it, so I can't really comment. This um, uh, but, this sounds complicated. Um, I I I think uh, it's time for a Les Odorants uh, premiere uh, reveal which is that I don't believe I've ever tried Shalimar. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I can see James's look of absolute disgust on the monitor here. <laughs> <laughs> just like pure, just what sort of amateur is this? But honestly, I don't think I have. However, uh, uh, and and I... I will finish because I think this is probably the last words I ever get to say on this podcast before I'm removed <laughs> as host. Um, I I really like Lillian. I found it similar to a Roger Parfums one called Parfums de la Nuit Number no. Two, um, which is uh, quite a complicated name. But um, it, you know, instantly I agree with that sort of um, animalic. Um, labdanum sort of base thing that it's got going on um, because that's what I get from uh, Delanui. Uh, Delanui also has a very boozy, um, I think it's cognac or something type top note, um, uh, cognac or rum, you know, one of those brown boozy efforts. But um, it's uh, it, it's really good, but I decided I preferred the Roger uh, to the Chanel. Um, okay, go on, tell me what twat I am for having not tried Shalimar. <laughs> uh, I, d- I don't think so at all um i mean a lot of the time it's not really um uh, i i'd say l- the only reason i've really uh given it sort of mu- m- you know much focus is because of making perfume mm. um i think for wearing it i've never owned it uh, i've never had a bottle myself i've never felt compelled to have it um because it's kind of it was a uh, a forerunner to loads of other stuff, uh, loads of other kind of, you know, these that kind of deep sort of spicy, ambery perfumes that that uh, came after it. If you're still in that kind of mode of like, it's a woman's perfume, which obviously, you know, we're men of the world, we don't necessarily think like that. Um, but there's no reason why you necessarily would, would seek it out. So um, I think you, you'll you'll smell it and go, oh, well, I've smelled loads of other perfumes that are like this. But you know, it was probably the first, uh, the you know, the original one. So well, no, sh- no shame in not in not trying it. Well, I think the uh, the idea of gender in perfumes is obviously something we're going to come uh, onto at some point with this podcast. Uh, you know, it's sure. a fairly well trodden uh, discussion, but I think it's probably worth saying. Uh, right out front, that that not a one of us is hung up on the uh, marketing gender of of, of perfumes. Um, you know, I don't believe in the idea of women's perfume, and there's certain things that that come off to me as quite feminine, um, particularly like yellow florals. On the whole, tend to to be that way. But the idea of I won't wear that because it's a woman's perfume is is plainly ridiculous i I very much love jicky um which was you know one of the original women's perfumes right um okay well um uh nice to know uh ben you've been wearing uh the chanel and james a couple of things you mentioned uh just uh piqued my interest a little bit um i'd love to know a bit about the um was it the essential parfums musk um only because i have been wearing myself this week um the essential parfums uh, was Imperial, which uh, I took delivery of. I think I mentioned in the last episode. Um, I've yeah. been really enjoying that. How, how's the musk? And is it also a Quentin Biche composition? No, no. It's uh, it's by uh, Khalees Becker. What else has Khalees Becker done? L- quite a few Killians. Ooh. A Taste of Heaven, Back to Black, Imperial oh. Tea. Yeah, quite a few uh, for Killian. Oh, J'adore. That's Quite quite a repertoire then. Uh, yeah, Amber S. Eccentrico for. Oh, Armani. I really like that one actually. Uh, it's slightly uh, rubbery as all as all uh, you know ambers tend to be, but um, yeah, nice. Well, she's obviously well qualified. How how's the uh, musk she's done for essential parfums? Fantastic! It's the best. It's the best one from that from that line. Better better than Bois Imperial. I don't really like Bois Imperial. To be <gasps> <honest>. <laughs> I like I like I like the style. Yeah. Um I got my 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 missus wore it and we walked in the forest and she was like downwind of me like uh, about like I don't know 50 meters or something mm-hmm. and I could I could smell her like and it was like choking me out. So oh, yeah. it's a, it's pretty strong. It um is. and it's very 
modern like i love it when i first spray it i'm like oh my god that's amazing and then within about an hour i'm like i'm i'm tapping out i'm fatigued from it but i think that's just the style yeah okay uh, i mean I, I i've really enjoyed it but i i do know what you mean about um you kind of can get a bit fatigued by it it's it's quite linear um for me uh i always found uh the you mentioned them last uh, episode but the mark anton uh, Barwa, Bar- Bar- God, my French pronunciation is horrific. It's, um, it's Barwa because the Bar-Wa. man himself actually spelled it phonetically for me in a comment because I was ah. like, Bar- Barrios? What is Barrios? it? Barrios. Barros. Yeah. Bar- <laughs> Bar- well, there you go. Barwa. Um, so the Mark Anton one, Barwa ones, um, B683 and Ganymede, both of which I found a little bit too metallic uh for my tastes um they both have uh, i think i described the uh, ganymede as being um like a sort of uh, um, an apple sitting in a uh, dentist's uh surgery aboard a spaceship it's kind of like <laughs> it's sort of like super futuristic metal apple thing um yeah and and it, i found it a bit much but the while imperial or was i don't know i'm terrible with this uh, my pronunciation will come and go um i i found it um a lot more tolerable less metallic um no discernible apple note either so um mm-hmm. and, and generally easier to work with um, so I've been enjoying that. Um, I have worn the new Moncler, uh, uh Poor Hom, uh, which is which is not quite the piece of shit you'd imagine it would be. Um, I did sort of imagine it would be like just a um, an Aventus or Sauvage Me Too kind of thing, and it's not. If, if it's close to anything at all, it's close to uh, Himalaya. Uh, by Creed, uh, again slightly sort of metallic and silver in 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 its style. Did you get the bottle of the the Moncler with the the little dot matrix thing That's on it? That's the can... only reason I got it. <laughs> of course yeah. it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because so... I I wanted to get it just to write my review on it to say this is a fucking piece of shit. <laughs> <Whatever>. <laughs> But because um, I was like, yes, that's but but it'll cost me like 150 quid to do a review just to be funny for like two minutes, <laughs> yeah, so 20 seconds like, nah. of amusement. Yeah, yeah. No, I I got this on eBay for for quite a bit less than that. Um, but uh, yeah, it is good, and uh, my kids and I have been programming insults at each other on it. So so that's <laughs> that's cool. Um, well, my, my mind was open when I saw the notes. I didn't think it was going to be a piece of shit necessarily. I'm always I'm believe it or not, I'm quite a positive person and i always think i always hope the perfumes are going to be good i really yeah it's it's not a terrible perfume i don't think it it, it's terrible it's not a by the numbers me too uh fragrance which you know is good and and as a first perfume from the house i think it's a little more daring than you'd expect from what's essentially a uh you know a a designer house right um as in designer fashion house so um i i i wouldn't say i really like it but i certainly don't hate it i wore Cheruti 1881 um i was sort of motivated to buy it because i'd read about the passing of um uh, monsieur nino Chiruti. nino Chiruti. um i was not a guy I, I i knew a great deal about and um i thought i'd go and find out a little bit um he seems like a pretty cool sort of guy um and the fragrance uh, is nice really nice it's very very thin though um and and it didn't last you know at all for me but then it was kind of 12 quid um and it does come in a rather handsome bottle which you know for the gram is all good I, I I adore that perfume. I've had it, um, you know, since the the nineties. It's always been a, a kind of staple in my collection because it's always been cheap, pretty much, um, and yeah, just something that I've always had. Now my bottle's probably fairly old, but it's not that it's not that old. Like I say, I kind of replaced, um, you know, an older one that I had. I always mm-hmm. tend to try and keep it because I I do wear that quite a lot, um, but. 
Yeah, I, I mine's pretty strong. Like, uh, you know, um, so maybe coming to, you know, vintage and reformulation, mm. uh, a 10 year old bottle might be far better. I don't know. But, well, um, we'll, we'll see. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you, James telegraphing our second section a little bit there. We will be talking That's for, about Yeah, foreshadowing. Foreshadowing. Right. Excellent. <laughs> um, ben, have you tried uh, the Shiruti uh, 1881? No, I've not. No, it's. Um... I've, I've avoided that and all its flankers because it has many flankers as well. Oh, does it? I, um, I, honestly, I didn't even know. I think so I, I, I haven't. Um, I sort of hadn't really ever bothered to check it out. You know, it's not um, not out of snobbery or anything. I'd, I'd put it more down to laziness and and sort of uh, you know, there's always something to be uh, chasing around something new. Um, but uh, I, yeah, I just thought, oh well. It's, 12 quid on ebay i think that cost uh, for a bottle um and it is you know it's nice um one of the other things i wanted to just go back to james on your list was you mentioned you wore a uh, b-men by mugler um so jumping into our news section um obviously it was sort of somewhat saddened uh, uh by the passing of mugler not not a person i knew personally or, or knew well but obviously it's sad when anyone dies. Uh, but I don't really know a lot about him. Um, my understanding is his main contribution to perfumery was Amen. Um, and then he kind of licensed his name uh, and, uh, and and a whole range of flankers and follow-ons were, were kind of spawned. I, I mean, I should point out my wife's favourite perfume is Angel uh, by Mugler. She wears that okay. a lot. So, um, yeah. and there's definitely been some good perfumes. How, how was, um, how was B-Men? Um, yeah, B Men. I I obviously like it, or I wouldn't have uh, I wouldn't have bought it. But uh, it's a kind of very lesser known. What I like is it has a kind of tart, uh, almost. I mean, just describe it as a rhubarb note, but I don't know. It's just a kind of sharp, sour, um, a be- almost like berries or something in the in the kind of opening. But generally speaking, the the fragrance itself is a woody. Uh, it's got that sweet. Uh, amen kind of vibe to it um I'd, I'd say it's less like the amen uh other flankers well i, I can't really say that because there's been some wacky ones hasn't there mm. but gem- generally speaking your pure malt your you know all mm. the the kind of first ones they do have that kind of you know they smell a bit like the original but uh they're not probably maybe not quite as interesting as the original it was quite quite man centric what you were saying there about his contribution being a man because it's probably more the feminine perfumes like you know obviously he's saying your missus wears um, angel and mm. uh, what's the other one um, alien uh, yeah like alien and uh, that I know it's not particularly uh, clearly it wasn't a huge success but there was that woman woman in woman in. <laughs> Womanity. Woman in a, womaninity. Woman. Yeah, that. Woman. Yeah. That. Mm. <laughs> They've got great balls. Wo- womanity. I think it's womanity. Womanity. Put, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, probably. Uh, probably fair. I. Um, but my experience, obviously, has largely been with the masculines. Um, I wore a men uh, for a period of time when I was younger. Uh, when it first came out, I really enjoyed that. Um, it was. Very, very strong. I remember that. It, it, you know, really persistent. Brutal. Yeah, like a sort of chocolatey sort of uh, vibe to it. Um, and it, it just went on for eternity. Another news story, just very quickly, um, because I can't tell you a great deal about it, um, but uh, Drakkar Noir Intense uh, is available, and I have ordered a bottle on eBay. It cost me £25, and I am... Very excited about it. The notes look absolutely superb, um, and so I'm uh, I'm absolutely psyched. Uh, you guys uh, heard anything about this? I've only heard w- w- when you mentioned it um, the other day, and you posted that picture. And I, I, for a second, I was like, "Is this new? Like, is this it?" Because because they, they've kept the old bottle design and everything, haven't they? And uh, all the old font work and everything. Like that, that like there's nothing updated about it in terms of visually speaking. Every bit of that is correct, but the bottle itself is orange rather than black. Um, but the f- right. font, uh, the typeface, um, and uh, you know the font and, and all that jazz, it is identical. But the bottle itself is orange. Um, it's still got a black cap, weirdly. Uh, but the notes 
uh, look just absolutely uh, brilliant. Um, I will read them out very quickly. Uh, rosemary, wormwood, bergamot, coriander, uh, lavender, juniper berries, clary sage, uh, patchouli, moss, and suede. Now that sounds like the ultimate masculine fragrance to me, and for £25, uh, I am going to find out. So, although I can't tell you a great deal about it yet, I look forward to reviewing it on this show. Yeah, I look forward to hearing about it. I don't think Dracar Noir was such a big thing in the UK, was it? I don't think. I think it's more it's more iconic in America, um, being a... You know, because it is actually a flanker of the original Dracar, which n- nobody seems to ever talk about. Uh, I, the only Guy La Roche that I have is uh, called Horizon, and that's in a similar bottle. Uh, the fact that you can still get um, vintages of it for next to nothing now means that, like, no one wants it, basically. Um, but I like it. I like it. It's a strange mixture it's almost because i think it came out in the 90s exactly that period we're talking about like 94 or something like that Mm. and it was the the transition between your 80s sort of powerhousey type uh, you know aromatic whatever it it mixed with an aquatic so it's kind of like it's it's almost like the transition like the midpoint Mm. between those two things and that that can either be like you know great for some people or you'll just think it's a terrible mess uh, I'm jury's still out to be honest. I'd never tried it at the time when it was out, um, mm. but I I bought a bottle fairly recently, and uh, yeah, I quite like it. It's uh, it's a bit of a weirdo. It's the fragrance equivalent of the movie Wall Street, which was sort of marking the shifting of the era from uh, like eighties uh, kind of uh, money hungry, uh, dodgy insider dealing bullshit. Uh, into, uh, I guess, the new world. Uh, Right, I want to move us along quickly to our brand new section, which is throwback to last episode. And um, because we're hideously overrunning, I want to just uh, make a couple of points uh, in follow-up to last week's episode. Um, First is to say... Uh, that uh, I'm extremely grateful to Ben for sending me samples of Eau Noir and Oud Infini. And um, I'll be honest, I did not like them. They're like two of Ben's absolute all-time favourites as well. It's basically my two favourite perfumes <laughs> of all time. I know, <laughs> so I'll be gentle. Um, Oud Infini is a work of art. Um, I know exactly what you mean when you said uh, on the last episode about the chic elegance of kind of high fashion. That's exactly what you get from Oud Infini. There's something incredibly sort of artistic and, and potent and creative about it. Unfortunately, you have to scrape several sort of kind of layers of cow muck off in order to get to that. I I found the skank too much for me, okay? Uh, I mean, that's the bottom line. It's just too much skank. Um, as As a creative piece, brilliant. I can see you dying to jump in there, Ben. Go on. Well, so when you say you have to scrape it off, like... I'm the complete opposite. I'm like, no, you've got to revel in it. That's the that's the joy. You've got to, <laughs> you've got to revel in smelling of poo. Brilliant. If, Absolutely. If, if it wasn't there, though, what would that perfume be? It would just be like an elegant rose, jasmine, whatever. It needs that there, doesn't it? It, it does. Absolutely. It does. And, and interestingly, um, I smell um, uh, a similar, not wildly dissimilar fragrance, actually, a Bodicea one, a house which, incidentally, I've mostly found to be absolute crap, um, you know, gloriously overrated, um, gloriously overpriced stuff. Um, but um, Bodicea Nebulous uh, has that same very sort of real, um, and I assume it's real oud, but but it's got that certainly very realistic sort of barnyard kind of thing going mm. on. Um, but the Dior Au Noir... I had kind of mixed feelings about it. It's, it's quite an interesting... Oh, it's a very interesting perfume, in fact, uh, and it really does shift around a lot. Um, my f- initial impression was, um, you know, very much curry. This smells like curry. Curry water. Uh, and, and and I sort of had this, um, this vision of... Um, uh, the, the local... There's an Indian restaurant around the corner from me, and the, at the back of it, there's a K 
cafe. Um, and the cafe, if you sit outside the front, you can see the bins behind this Indian restaurant. <laughs> and and I, I had this sort of vision of drinking very strong coffee, looking at the bins of discarded Indian food. And that, to me, is sort of how <laughs> au noir smell, in the, which I know is not selling it to a lot of our listeners. Um, but that's sounds like paradise to me. But... Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't say <laughs> paradise exactly. Um, but uh, as it sort of mellows, there's a surprising sweetness uh, to it that came through. And um, weirdly, I sprayed it. And, and I sprayed it, I think, on my watch by sort of almost by accident i sprayed some on my wrist got some on my watch and um and it's not come off my bloody watch you know it's actually <laughs> stuck to this kind of this uh, you know metal uh, watch clasp and it, it, you know that's how tenacious this stuff is and um actually i was kept thinking this is this smells really great um the initial curry sort of subsides and you get this really great lavender coffee um thing i don't know what else to call it really but it's sort of lavender coffee but it's very deep and dark and slightly sweet and uh yeah i I really enjoyed it towards the end but it was just the initial curry thing was just way too much for me Uh, i i always find it interesting when people talk about that perfume that the the lavender is like an afterthought whereas the lavender is so pronounced in that perfume like i i see it as a lavender perfume with all that uh, embellishment kind of just just mi- mingled into it and that's what makes it so surprising for me mm. in that I don't really like a lavender centric perfume I'm not a big uh, Caron Om fan uh, I don't like those kind of oh yeah just revel in the kind of beauty of like yeah lavender's nice but like you know I find it a little bit boring perhaps um, but also it depends the origins of the lavender because there's certain lavender oils that I'm like Oh, I really like that, or it's it, it works better in uh, blends and stuff like that. So whatever is being used in that Eau Noir, just immediately, it was like intoxicating. But yeah, there's all that other stuff going on, and uh, I'd quite happily sit, you know, in a cafe round the back of an Indian restaurant and take all that, you know, sweet kind of curry juice out of the bins or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd, I'd take it all in, you know. I'd sip my coffee. One. So yeah, I mean Eau Noir. It's I get that it's not it's not everyone's cup of tea, but I really like that it's like you know that your sighting is one of your favourite perfumes, uh, Ben, because it's not really a lot of people's favourite perfumes, and I think that's I think it's great. It's probably one of my favourites, I have to say. I, I shouldn't like it really because I really can't handle lavender most of the time, but in that perfume, I just think yeah, it works. I get it. It's yeah. fine. And it has this it has this weird proximity thing for me where close up you might smell lavender, but at a distance or if you spray mm. it in a room, you smell the coffee. To me, coffee is like the first thing that kind of hits you. And then the la- it's it's really weird. It's kind of a sort of olfactory like flip paint or, you know, whatever mm. you want to call it. It's got this weird kind of effect. And I, I love that about it. I think that's my favourite thing about it is how it... Uh, flip flops all over the place constantly, and it's just when you think you've got a grasp of it, it, it changes quite significantly depending on, like you say, like proximity or like heat or all these kind of differentials, and it, it changes really. And I, I can think of another perfume that does something similar, and another perfume that I absolutely love because of it, and it's a uh, uh, Vetiver Oriental by Serge Luton, and that one just flip flops from like one minute, it's like this intensely kind of rock and roll ripped jeans kind of thing and the next minute it's quite sweet and like very feminine and and then all of a sudden it has this like really black tie vibe to it you know like it's it gets really formal when it's it flip-flops all over the place from this basically like very rooty spiky vetiver to a very soft smooth sweet chocolate sort of thing and 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 i love that about perfumes when they're they then they just don't want to settle into one lane if you know what i mean and they just bounce around certainly the stuff you sent me uh ben and and i'm extremely grateful uh, for the chance to have tried it but it absolutely does not conform to sort of standard perfume uh expectations you know what did you think of nuit de fur it it didn't strike me as as out there as uh the other stuff you you sent me that those, those two yeah it's dead simple yeah um i mean it was nice but sort of didn't sort of make me think, 
oh yeah, I, I, you know, I see why Ben, who loves these really complicated, insane perfumes, it, I, I, it didn't leap out to me as, oh yeah, Ben seriously digs this stuff. Uh, but then, you know, you surprised me last week by saying uh, you really liked Imperator. So um, one lives and learns. Um, I want to move <laughs> us along um, only because we're going to uh, time out talking about your favourite perfumes. So uh, thanks for that, guys. Um, hope everyone's enjoyed part one. Stay with us and we'll catch you in part two. Welcome back to part two of Les Odorants. Um, in this section today, we're going to be talking about vintage fragrances. Uh, vintage is a big deal in the fragrance world, but is it necessarily better? And what the bloody hell does vintage even mean? Um, so look, before we get stuck into this debate, um, I'm just going to throw out there a couple of perfumes that I particularly uh, love and miss um and uh you know for me vintage when i think of vintage i think like genuinely old perfume like uh you know 30 40 years old not you know something that got reformulated last week but was only released six months earlier so we're going to call it a vintage um but um so for me uh, seminal sort of perfumes have been like a uh, guerlain derby um and patu pour um balenciaga pour uh, uh sort of fragrances that when i smell them they genuinely kind of like move me on some sort of emotional level without sounding too much like a dickhead um so those those are fragrances that when someone says vintage uh, to me i go yep that's for me ben if i asked you what vintage fragrances you like what would you say I, to be honest, I'm not like into very, very old vintage. I'm not really into vintages at all. So to me, vintage is, is probably stops around about the early 90s. Um, my, If I was going to say like I had a favourite vintage, it would be Calvin Klein Eternity, um, which is not that old. I suppose I've dabbled a little bit on the eBay uh, with some vintage Guerlain's, like serious vintages, but but that's a different thing altogether, almost in my head. Mm. That's um, that's almost like antiquity. Antiquity, you know, antiqui- well, an- antiquities uh, rather than vintages. Well, but uh, I, I think that is probably just showing up the age gap between us. But uh, James, vintage for you. What 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 is it that moves you when it comes to vintage? Um, well, I, like I say, I have written a kind of short list, but it's it ain't very short. I think if I if I'm gonna sort of break it down. Uh, my absolute favourite, uh, probably one of my favourite perfumes of all time, is uh, Cri de Rossi by uh, Chanel. Um, and uh, I can't really describe what I what I love about that. Um, and it's only really in recent years that I've thought, um, you know, that I that I really love um, that kind of floral leather sort of interplay. Uh, there was actually a woman who uh, was really kind of pivotal in my sort of collecting kind of days and it was it was quite a long time ago now and she used to come to like vintage fair type things and I think her husband had worked in the perfume industry and they possibly had a shop once because she had lots of stock and she had like she was a big collector and had loads of old vintage Shalimar and Mitsuko and all these things and she let me try them uh, I don't know how, because she used to go into the university because I used to live near a university and they used to have like people are coming with like vinyl records and like, you know, mm. they, they kind of do it in the library of the thing. And I'm sure she probably never sold anything because, you know, it was all like uh, vintage, you know, or, unopened like Chanel's and stuff. But she, I tried some kind of old uh, Parfum version from like the 60s or, or 50s or something that she had and it was incredible. And, I, you know, I was like that's the kind of perfumes that I, I want to mm. kind of get into. Um, but then, you know, never really uh, did it. And then I've probably sold more vintages than I own currently, which I was uh, saying to Ben earlier. Uh, so I've kind of had the bug and then gone, it ain't really that, you know. Uh, you can buy minis or things where you can sample them mm. um, and get the same experience without having to fork out on the bottles, which a lot of people are precious about and leave in their cupboards and don't wear, which mm. is 
you know a ridiculous kind of thing, isn't it? Oh, oh just on that point, and and I, I don't want to interrupt your list because I know this is going to be a good one. But um, <laughs> there is this sort of received wisdom in 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 the fragrance world that somehow older is better, and um, you know. Uh, it's always going to be stronger. And we touched on the Shiruti earlier, which, you know, arguably may well have been stronger in in its heyday. Um, but, it, you know, I don't think that's always universally the, the case. And certainly um, I I spent a reasonable amount of time chasing down a vintage bottle of Cacherel pour on because um, I remember wearing that at university and thinking it was a great perfume. Um, and actually, uh, it's not really a great deal stronger than it is today. And it just smells kind of dated and a bit shit if i'm honest um i mean i think it was nice at the time but um i i, I couldn't wear that now the same goes for ysl jazz i think um so uh, i mean do, do, do you think that fragrances were necessarily stronger back in back in the day in uh in many cases yes just from you know experience but i would kind of say that perhaps uh there is there is something to be said for the kind of aging process certainly with the uh materials used in the bases and stuff like that they mature over time one of the things people talk about a lot um and uh and there's a there's someone with a, a great instagram uh, name I, I i really love creative instagram uh names uh, but someone who posts with the name Ifra Killed My Mojo, which I think is a great name for a, an Instagram account. But, you know, Ifra gets a lot of flack in the perfume community. And uh, and I have to confess, um, I'm quite an experienced perfume smeller, but I don't know shit about stuff like ifra you know people just go if ifra ruined it ifra diluted this ifra this ifra that um what the bloody hell is the story with ifra and i'm looking at you james because i know you know something about this we'll hone in on exactly what people are bothered about and it's oak moss right mm, <laughs> most of the yeah. time it is oak moss that people are bothered about and they are you know our um you know, old sheepers and all these kind of things that we, uh, you know, that we're, we're missing, uh, you know, it's the oak moss that's the problem, right? So basically the the the, the oak moss contains uh, probably, I don't know if it has any more sort of allergens in, but it's the atronol, chloroatronol and eugenol, which are the main uh, prohibited, uh, you know, r- r- restricted materials. And the reason that, ifra exists is to stop more draconian measures of regulators from european countries which tend to be quite you know like say uh quite strict on things uh to come in and say no you're having an absolute blanket ban on that you can't do that so ifra is actually on the side of uh perfume collectors and uh, people to to ensure that these things don't get banned outright (laughs) <laughs> because they're saying what are the safe levels and then they there's another organization which i'm not very good with my homework and i haven't i can't remember what they're called but they're the actual ones who do all the science so they do all the testing and all the um you know the uh, sensitization and irritation and all that kind of stuff and they basically come up with uh you know a a, a, a reasonable um uh, sort of data that the that IFRA then uses to determine what safe levels are. And another thing that people always bemoan, oh, the levels are always coming down and there's always this, that's that's bollocks, right? Because you can look at IFRA Amendment 48 to 49. Now, I think it's on 50, but there wasn't many changes. So 48 to 49, there was quite a lot of changes, right? And if you actually look at those, uh, like eugenol, uh, the amount of eugenol that you can use compared to 48 to 49 is about four times as much, you know, and like iso eugenol acetate, there's loads of other things that have gone up, right? So people always go on, oh, they're restricting things, they're bringing things down. But by the same rule, if more data becomes available, they make a judgment on it and go, oh, okay, we can stick, we can stick that stuff back up again. So it's not... Um, it's not this doom and gloom kind of thing that it's always going to be going down and all your favourite materials are going to be restricted to to hell. Now, there's another argument where people say, well, 
what how good is the science that they're doing and all that kind of thing and yes you can you, you can pick that apart all you want or say that the sample sizes aren't big enough or that they're not doing the right kinds of testing or whatever and if somebody has legitimate scientific uh, arguments to to the contrary then we're all ears and we'll listen to them right but most of the time people just go oh they're, they're doing this or that and they really don't understand what it is that they are actually doing mm. also the the skill of a perfumer is to be able to take uh you know the the restrictions as they are and be able to create something now some perfumers might even say to you oh well i can't do certain things because of uh if or whatever but i doubt they would ever say oh i i can't be creative or make decent perfume or whatever because of uh, because of any restrictions certainly things like jasmine there was people moaning about jasmine on the that that amendment that I was talking about the 40 that was the one. big thing on the amendment wasn't it yeah and, because and, people immediately freaked out and thought all of our perfumes like how many perfumes are going to be affected by this and i think it was just like a big if, if you don't really understand it it's a big thing that's going to freak you out and i think that's basically what happened right yeah it's again it's scaremongering as well because people are saying mm. oh my favorite moogler perfumes and i'm like how much of that moogler perfume do you really think it has like real jasmine absolute in it um that is an accord probably created from uh, aroma chemicals or whatever but uh, irrespective of that the amount of jasmine absolute that you can use is quite a lot right and i would even say the amount of real oak moss with the atronol and the chloratronol is still quite a lot, right? But then you can also bolster that oak moss with uh, vera moss or, uh, or, mm. or rectified oak moss, right? Which again, people say, oh, it's not as good. Well, maybe it isn't. But in my personal experience, just to, and again, I'm no perfumer, I'm no person telling anybody what else they can smell or can't smell. But my personal experience of it is that uh, the, the, the amount of oak moss, like, it, it, it's still quite a lot, you know? Okay, you can't make really big old, like, sheepers and stuff, but just find a kind of way around it. That's the whole thing. You've got to be creative mm. and you've got to be commercially viable and you've got to uh, find new ways. That's why new materials, that's what drives the perfume industry and the aroma chemicals and everything. It's not doom and gloom, let's replace everything with synthetics or whatever. And that's the thing people think it's naturals versus synthetics. They're all one and the same thing. They're all materials that can be utilised to, to make perfume. And the more people see that, uh, the, 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 you know, the better it'll be. Uh, mm. But I'll never, get, I'll never get through to people saying all this shit, so I might as well, you know, piss in the wind. Play, play them this episode on repeat. <laughs> just, just send them a link to this. So, uh, cool. Let's uh, jump back to your list then, James, because I rudely interrupted you. What else is on your list? Uh, Yves Saint Laurent Kouros, uh, pretty staple uh, perfume from a men's point of view. Um, I, I think the new one, certainly the new one, has kind of been made for, uh, I, I believe, to be more palatable to modern tastes uh, rather than the old, very sort of animalic, uh, kind of the, the dirtiness of the old one makes people think it's dated so i think in order to keep it relevant and in order to keep it in production uh, i think there's there's been a, a level of change but to be honest i think the the old uh the old bottles so i'm talking like i don't know like 90s or like 80s or whatever are really quite something special um i've you know have been sent samples uh, quite fortunately and uh, have had some of the 80s ones i think my bottle is 90s possibly it might even I, I i have no idea um, but i've got a couple of bottles of uh vintage chorus which are pretty good and are pretty close to those those 80 samples that i've that i've tried just to jump in on the kuros thing um kuros is a really special fragrance for me because it's the fragrance my dad uh has always kind of worn um uh, now he wears different stuff now because i sort of uh, you know give him uh, perfumes and say wear this wear that whatever um but i have very fond memories um a very strong kind of scent memory if you like of being um very young in the sort of uh, late 80s 
um, waiting for my parents to go out for dinner or something on a Saturday night and dad putting, you know, he wasn't a fanatic over sprayer or anything, but dad putting on a couple of sprays of Kuros and the whole house just smelling of this thing. I mean, it <laughs> is, you know, the vintage Kuros was wild and someone sent me uh, a very small sample of that uh, a, a couple of weeks ago and I sprayed it and and instantly just kind of transported back to kind of being you know 11 years old waiting for mum and dad to go out for dinner it was amazing stuff amazing yeah I mean it's a one spray job in it it's not a, like you you can you can get away with one spray of of chorus all right what else is on your list James uh, so okay brute old spice Aramis uh nice. Rocas Monsieur uh, Zeno Davidoff, uh, Balenciaga Poor Harm. Uh, I do like the old Dior's. Uh, a lot of them are marketed to women. So the Miss Dior, uh, Dorissimo, uh, Diorissimo, Diorissimo, which I don't Simo. think I like. Yeah, I don't think I like that one too much. Uh, Diorella, I'm not sure about that one. Dior Essence, now that was a later one in the late 70s made by Guy Robert, which I love. Um, probably not one of the most like favourite uh, Dior's for other people, but I really love that one. Uh, kind of smells similar to like Kalash and some of those kind of powdery sort of peachy uh, kind of things that he's done elsewhere, but loads of depth, great fragrance. Um, Barmain, they did loads of uh, stuff with um, obviously uh, Jermaine Sellier, who's like a legendary sort of perfumer. She did lots of green things uh, like mm. Vent Vert and uh, Jolie Madame, which I hadn't tried until recently, but a very kind uh, friend on Instagram uh, sent me a sample. So uh, bless her for that. And it's a pretty old, I mean, it's like old. <laughs> like, old. Uh, very old, yeah. Um, and it was beautiful, kind of violet leather sort of thing. Yes, it's a little bit jaded because it's old. Some of the top notes are probably not as intended, but uh, a great fragrance. What, what, uh, what's just, sorry, just on that, Jay. Yeah. What do you reckon is the oldest perfume you have? That I have. I don't have very many old ones. Um, I've got some minis that I don't know how old they are. I think they're potentially from the 60s, mm. uh, but I can't. There's no batch codes or it's very difficult to find information on them. So I've got some Barmain uh, little minis of like, you know, men's ones and stuff. And I've got a moustache, uh, a rock ass oh, moustache, nice. uh, which is pretty old. I think it's I think it's 60s possibly. Um, oh. But yeah, I haven't really got anything particularly old. But like I say, minis is a really good way of getting fairly cheap uh, perfumes that you can try them, and at least you know whether you want a full bottle or not. Yeah, um, absolutely. I, I think the the main sort of iconic men's Dior is Eau Sauvage, which is a truly superb fragrance. I have loads of minis of those. Mm. Uh, I think they're all sort of eight seventies and eighties, um, but they're like absolute superb and you can get them for a decent price um and yeah i probably would get you know older formulations of that um can i can i just ask the same question to ben as well although i think i know the answer what's the oldest fragrance you've got as i've actually got like an 80s kuros oh really um, yeah but i don't wear it as a perfume right? so it's just a tiny bit left in the bottle mm. and, and very much your story that i could relate to it was my dad's mm. And if, he only ever wore it when we went out for meals. And so, like, a couple of times a year, like, he would wear it and the whole house would stink of it. Amazing. And uh, he found it a little while back and um, he said, oh, do you want it? So I said, yeah, bring it around. So he, he brought it around and I put it in my medicine cabinet because it remind, when I was a kid, I used to open the medicine cabinet and it used to stink of Kuros. Mm. So I just put it in my medicine cabinet and just kind of let it smell my medicine cabinet out Amazing. so i've got this nostalgic kick when i open my medicine cabinet um so i don't spread there's the tiniest bit maybe like two mil left in it um but it's yeah really old bottle um but aside from that like perfume that i actually would wear um is uh issy uh 1998 bottle mm. of uh load issy um which is not that old. Well, it's still 24 years ago, uh, which is uh, incredible even to say that out loud. Disturbing. Yeah, <laughs> I've, I've got a Mitsuko from the 60s, I think. I've got the Patu. I've got an old uh, Guerlain Derby um, and one or two other bits. But then I've got a whole bunch of kind of discontinued designers from kind of the, the 90s and early 2000s from Escada, which I think did some really great mm. fragrances. You've got that grey one, haven't you? 
Uh, oh, Casual Friday? Casual Friday, that's it. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. I really like that one. Again, um, I've it, never tried that. Okay, well, I'll tell you what. We should do a meet-up, and I'll bring all me oldies uh, for you. So, um, so look, time is uh, uh, moving on, and, and I, I want to just kind of wrap us up with one other question, right, uh, which is sort of adjunct to the vintage thing, but is is all modern perfume shit? Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I'm going to sort of answer my own question and say, no, I don't think it is. I think there is a lot of modern shit, but it is not the case that all modern perfume is shit. I think there are, uh, you know, there's this proliferation of indie houses um, doing all sorts of uh, crazy, wonderful stuff. I mean, uh, just hat, hat tip to, um, I mentioned the World in Sense uh, last time. They get another mention. Uh, Rogue, Rogue Perfumery. Um, I've enjoyed quite a lot of uh, uh, what he's done. M- Manny, I think his name is. Um, and then um, there's a guy... Uh, who uh, posts on Instagram, who I've followed for a bit, called Freddie Albrighton, um, who I think is a tattoo artist turned perfumer. Um, and he made a fantastic video recently um, of the manufacturing process of his perfume, you know, from soup to nuts, you know, the whole thing. So I think, uh, personally, I think there's lots of really challenging avant-garde exciting stuff going on still in the world of perfumery despite the fact that a lot of modern stuff remains total toss um ben what's your take on that i i agree on that i really like about modern perfumery like you say that like there, there's so much more access these days for anyone to have a go like i've like we were saying earlier like i've dabbled with like perfumery and and I mean, I would say I'm more than dabbled. I've got like a line that's ready to go if I had the balls to do it. Um, and, you know, James has dabbled quite heavily in perfumery. But the point is we can all go online and buy these materials. And I think that's created this like, some people call it bedroom perfumery or whatever, if they want to be kind of down on it. But I, I like to think of it as like punk rock, you know, mm. it's like the age of like punk perfume. It's like, do you know what? Fuck these guys. I'm going to do you know, we don't need Chanel. I'm going to sit in my bedroom and I'm going to make something that smells good. And and I think sometimes a lot of these perfumes, like they, they come with like a rawness that tells you, you know, that perhaps this person isn't classically trained. But I don't really see that as a problem. And I, I think as long as it's got creativity, then I think it's really good. So from that perspective, I really like it. But I would like to pose a question to you two who are really into your, like, or, or more into your vintages than mm. I would say I am. Um, so what makes, if, you know, if because if, if you want to say that is modern perfume shit, right? You're comparing it to vintages and you're saying that old perfume was better. So what makes a vintage perfume good then? Because there are hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands of vintage perfumes that are at a shit, right? Mm. So the ones that make it and stand the test of time, is it, are they standing that test of time based on the fact that they're actually good perfumes or are they, as I suspect, uh, sort of products of their time and in a way that, that they encapsulate a feeling of an era mm. that that is very um, sought after by people seeking nostalgia? Kuros is a prime example. It is a really good question, and I, I've sort of wondered about this myself. So when I smell Guerlain Derby, am I sort of just hankering over some sort of nostalgic um, um, uh, sort of vibe, or or is it genuinely better? Now, I'm, I'm quite lucky in that I have a very old Derby, and I have the... Uh, the the more recent re-released one, and I I I don't know about whether the um, regulations changed anything. My instinct is the re sort of done one more recently was just to adjust for modern tastes more. It's it's that little bit more accessible. It's it's easier to wear. I prefer the sort of brutality and the sort of uh, raw kind of masculinity of the original. Uh, version um and i think i would do that in a sort of blind pepsi taste test i think i would still prefer it but there there is a part of me that just thinks christ do i just want to own these little nostalgic sort of 
bottles that look super gorgeous. Like I said, like the ones that stand the test of times are the ones that are really kind of like, I think personally, they're re- reminiscent of the age that they were bought out and they say a lot culturally about mm. the era almost, you know, like, and, and I think like, like, you know, the big ones that stand out, I feel like have done that. And but, there can and only be a few, there can only be a few of those, right? So mm. in, in your, in answer to that question, um, I think that there was, there was less perfume so there was, there was less choice, right, back then. You, you, mm. you know, that is that is true. Um, and that a lot of those perfumes were better quality or whatever, even the shit ones, right, because you're saying, oh, what about ones that were really shit? There weren't many uh, really out there kind of let's take a risk sort of thing as there perhaps is now. Um, and I was interested in you saying about the kind of punk sort of revolution of uh, people doing their own stuff. Because there is a big thing about about gatekeeping in uh, perfume, yes, and how yeah. uh, you know the access to those things, even just to the knowledge, to books, to whatever, has always been. It's passed down from from learning. Now, having said that, I would say that the building of the business and the all the stuff that goes with it is the important thing, and that's something that you can do for yourself now, rather than have to go and classically train and, uh, and and all mm. that kind of stuff. Okay, well, thanks for another fantastic discussion, chaps. Uh, really enjoyed this evening's talk. Um, hope everybody out there has enjoyed it too. I'm also very pleased to be able to tell you we've got a brand new Instagram page set up, at Les Odorants, and you will be able to email us there and also tune in to uh, mine, James's, and Ben's Instagram uh, pages as well. Uh, feel free to drop us a line if there's a subject you'd like us to discuss we'd love to hear from you uh, and we hope you enjoyed the show catch you next time cheers thanks